The 1980s. MTV ruled the airwaves, bringing in a steady stream of music into the homes of impressionable young viewers. And a lot of parents were freaking out. Satanic panic was at its peak, with some fearing that the so-called devil's music, rock and roll, would ruin lives and drive youngsters to do terrible things. Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest were being accused of encouraging fans to commit suicide. The Parents Music Resource Center compiled a list of objectionable songs and demanded that the music industry set standards that musicians would have to abide by, a movement that led to Dee Snyder, Frank Zappa, and John Denver having to testify at a Senate hearing. All of this madness helped inspire one of the greatest underseen horror movies of the decade. The 1986 release, Trick or Treat, which we're looking at in this episode of the best horror movie you never saw. Directed by Charles Martin Smith from a screenplay by Rhett Topham and producers Michael Murphy and Joel Soisson. Trick or Treat stars Mark Price, who at the time was playing the nerdy character Skippy on the classic sitcom Family Ties, as bullied metalhead teen Eddie Weinbauer. There are only two things that get Eddie through his miserable existence. His unrequited crush on the nice popular girl Leslie, played by Lisa Orgolini, and his fandom for rock star Sammy Kerr, who has such a wild stage show, which has been known to involve him biting the head off a snake and playing with its blood, that he's even had to defend himself at a Senate hearing. Sammy Kerr is from Eddie's hometown, he went to the same high school, and Eddie idolizes him because he rose above it all. Under the pen name Ragman, Eddie sends Sammy letters in which he pours his heart out to his hero. I want to thank you guys for watching the best horror movie you never saw and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like the video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. Real rock stars Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne are in the film's cast, but in supporting roles. Simmons pays homage to Wolfman Jag with his character radio DJ Nuke, while Osbourne is cast very much against his type as a clean-cut anti-rock evangelist. The role of Sammy went to Solid Gold and a chorus line dancer, Tony Fields, who was advised to hang out with musicians and study rock stars so he could emulate their style and attitude. Of course, that means that someone else had to provide the songs performed by Sammy, and the band chosen to make his music was Fastway, with Sammy's singing voice being that of Dave King, who went on to form the band Flogging Molly. Sammy was planning to play the high school Halloween dance, but the town council blocked his appearance. It seems that didn't matter in the long run because Sammy doesn't live to see Halloween falling victim to a hotel fire. He leaves behind one last unreleased album called Songs in the Key of Death. And the only copy is a studio demo on an acetate disc that was sent to Nuke with the instruction that the album be played on his radio station at midnight on Halloween night. Nuke makes a tape copy and gives the acetate disc to Sammy's biggest fan, Eddie. The film enters horror territory when Eddie realizes that there are back mask messages hidden on the album by playing the record backwards. Eddie is able to communicate with Sammy from beyond the grave and at first this is a very positive thing for him. With Sammy's advice and encouragement, he's able to stand up to his bullies led by Doug Savant as a preppy douche named Tim and get them back for all the torment they've put him through. But then Sammy starts to take things too far. Eddie realizes he's dangerous and tries to cut off their communication, and that's when the spirit of Sammy emerges through his stereo system, revealing he's more powerful and a bigger threat than Eddie imagined. Sammy is exactly the kind of rock star the parents of the 80s were so concerned about. He practiced the occult, he made a deal with the devil, his evil spirit lives on through the music recorded for Songs in the Key of Death. And when that album is played over the radio on Halloween night, 
he will have the ability to emerge through any radio in town and kill anyone he comes in contact with. He's out to raise hell in his hometown, and first, he's going to wreak havoc at the Halloween dance. The initial idea for Trick or Treat came from legendary producer Dino De Laurentiis. But at this point, it didn't have anything to do with rock music. De Laurentiis was apparently one of the few people who had been impressed by A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, when it was released in 1985, so he approached the film's line producers, Michael Murphy and Joel Soisson, with the project that would be titled Trick or Treat, and that it needed to be ready for theatrical release on October 24th, 1986, and could possibly be about a killer who goes door-to-door on Halloween night while wearing a pumpkin on his head. Murphy and Soissons were on board to have a movie called Trick or Treat ready for a Halloween 86 release, but they weren't interested in making a slasher movie like DeLorientis had pitched to them. And that idea sounded like DeLorientis was trying to cash in on Halloween, which would make sense since he was involved with Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, But what he was saying from the start was that he wanted a movie that would feature the next Freddy Krueger, not the next Michael Myers. That's why he went to the Freddy's Revenge guys. So Murphy and Swasson convinced him to ditch the simple slasher idea and go with something that had a supernatural angle to it. And that's when writer Rhett Topham came in with a pitch that blended the supernatural with rock and roll. Topham originally envisioned a film that would be much darker than the one that was made in the end, although the first name he had in mind for the evil rock star was Chilly Willy, just like the cartoon Penguin, he imagined his story would be the next Exorcist. But then Trick or Treat evolved into something campier and more satirical. But this wasn't a case of a story being taken away from the writer and turned into something they didn't approve of. Topham was totally on board with the tone of the finished film, even if it wasn't as dark as he first imagined. As he said in an interview 20 years later, One day, the producers convinced me that the spirit of this movie was more about kicking back, grabbing a six-pack, maybe a bong, and watching Eddie scramble to recork the genie's bottle he ultimately unleashed. With Sammy Kerr morphing out of stereo speakers and shooting death rays from his guitar, could it be anything else? Also playing into the film's lighter tone is the fact that director Charles Martin Smith wasn't a big horror fan. He'd enjoyed the genre when he was younger, but The Exorcist scared him so badly it put him off watching horror for the next decade. Murphy and Soissons had already looked over 40 different potential directors for Trick or Treat before they heard that Smith, who is best known for his acting roles in films like American Graffiti and The Untouchables and had about 15 years of screen credits to his name at that point, was also interested in directing. They set up a meeting and during their conversation, they were convinced that Smith was a match for what they had in mind for Trick or Treat. The actor was hired to make his feature directorial debut with this film. He wasn't a genre fan, But he wasn't getting any other directing offers, so he took the job. Smith has continued to direct film and television since. But aside from directing the pilot episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, he has stayed away from horror. He's even shied away from calling Trick or Treat a horror movie. But he also didn't want to call it a comedy. His description for the film? This is a rock and roll roll monster monster movie. movie. So, uh, A, we need a monster, and B, we need rock and roll. The producers did approach actual rock stars about playing Sammy Kerr, but as Swasson has said, in quotes, we got very negative feedback from these people. They read this whole satanic rock star thing is very negative and that wasn't what we wanted to do. So we went back and clarified our own personal beliefs. What comes out of the story is not to go along with the blind hero worship and also to be cautious about the very, very dangerous situation of the PMRC type mentality. Once the filmmakers made it clear that Trick or Treat wouldn't be a condemnation of rock and roll, they were able to get Gene Simmons and Ozzy involved. Simmons already had acting experience, so he was able to come in and perform his scripted lines like any other actor in the cast. The situation was different for Ozzy's cameo. This was something new for him to be doing, so Smith didn't even give him a script. He just brought Ozzy onto set and had him ad-lib his lines as the anti-rock evangelist. Ozzy really got into it and gave Smith about 45 minutes of material to work with, which was whittled down substantially for his appearance in the film. 
Blackie Lawless of Wasp was reportedly interested in playing Sammy Kerr until he found out that Fastway had already been hired to provide the music for the character and he didn't want to lip sync to another band's songs. In the end, the producers felt it would have been too distracting to have a musician the audience was already familiar with in the role of Sammy anyway. Viewers would know an established rock star was just goofing around and having fun playing the character, but they would be able to buy Tony Fields as the character without any baggage getting in the way. And Fields was so convincing with his rock star act, he even impressed the real rock stars in the cast. He told Fangoria in quotes, Ozzy and Gene never saw my work, but they were very, very supportive of what they saw as my look. I did a photo session with both of them, and I got nothing but compliments on how authentic I look and how I handled the guitar and myself as a rock star. Mark Price has said that his competition for the role of Eddie Weinbauer included Keanu Reeves, which seems logical since the producers would go on to cast Reeves as another music-obsessed teen in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure a few years later. But Swassana said he never met Reeves until the audition for Bill and Ted. So, someone is mistaken about when Reeves entered the picture, but either way, Bryce and Reeves were both perfectly cast in the two movies. Rhett Topham wrote the Eddie character as a reflection of himself. Eddie is Topham's middle name, and Price was dressed and groomed just like him. While Eddie looked like the writer, the actor who played his best friend Roger actually was a writer on the film. When Murphy and Swasson wanted to punch up the dialogue in the script, they turned to the writing duo of Glenn Morgan and James Wong, who they had worked with on a great thriller called The Boys Next Door the previous year. Then they went a step further and suggested that Morgan audition for a part in the movie, and he ended up being cast as Roger, without Smith knowing that he was friends with the producers or had worked on the script. Morgan didn't pursue an acting career after this, but he later described his time on the set of Trick or Treat as the best six weeks of his life. He and Wong went on to work on The X-Files, Final Destination, Final Destination 3 together, and Morgan himself directed the 2003 version of Willard and the 2006 Black Christmas remake. Trick or Treat seemed to enjoy a relatively smooth production. Smith said making the movie was a hoot, even if working with all the special effects would occasionally get exhausting. Made on a budget of $3.5 million, the film was ready for its October 24th, 1986 release date and ended up pulling in just under $7 million at the box office. Then came more money from the VHS rentals. Smith told HollywoodChicago.com that DeLorientis, in quotes, really loved the movie because it turned a profit. He would come up to me and say, Charlie, bravo, bravo. Trick or Treat had some success in the second half of the 80s and developed a cult following, but it has largely faded into obscurity over time. This is probably because it has never gotten a great DVD or Blu-ray release. When it did reach the DVD format, it was in full screen on a bare bones disc. It has been put on Blu-ray in a few countries, but even then, it wasn't a special edition packed with bonus features that the movie deserves. Fans are holding on to the hope that we'll see an awesome release of Trick or Treat someday, one with the interviews, documentaries, commentaries, and maybe that deleted scene of Eddie daydreaming that he's Conan slash Frank Frazetta-style barbarian, which we only know about because a picture from the scene was published in an issue of Fangoria. Trick or Treat deserves the special edition treatment because it's an incredibly entertaining film propelled forward by a fun 80s rock soundtrack. It starts out like a coming of age drama. The script, Smith's direction, and Mark Price's terrific performance work together effectively to get us to care about Eddie Weinbauer and to root for him to stand up against his bullies and end up with Leslie. But there's a dark edge to it all, and Eddie's beyond the grave interactions with Sammy get creepier and creepier as the film goes on. Then, when Sammy has reached peak creepiness and re-entered the world of the living as a burn-scarred homicidal maniac, the movie goes completely nuts in the second half. When Topham talked about Sammy morphing out of speakers and shooting death rays out of his guitar, that was an accurate description of what happens in the second half of the movie. While this is over the top compared to the approach taken in the first half, it doesn't feel out of place because the movie has a sense of humor about itself every step of the way. As Smith said, he shied away from going too dark with the material. Though his hesitancy to get too scary and intense, he did end up striking good balance of laughs and unease before just letting the movie go wild. Some viewers may prefer the tone of one half of Trick or Treat over the other, but 
As a whole, it works. The movie is a blast to watch. A rock and roller coaster ride. One of the craziest and best scenes in the movie involves a demon called Skeezix, who is Sammy Kerr's mascot, much like Iron Maiden has a mascot called Eddie the Head. The appearance of Skeezix seems to come out of nowhere for some viewers because the movie doesn't do the best job of establishing him as Sammy's mascot, even though Sammy does have a tattoo of the creature on his chest. But whether or not you've taken note of the demon before, the scene where it emerges into our world is certainly unforgettable. Eddie has made a tape copy of Songs in the Key of Death for Tim, calling it a peace offering, but the person who ends up listening to the tape is Tim's status-obsessed girlfriend Jeannie, played by Elise Richards. At first, this seems to be quite a pleasurable experience for her, but it's just Sammy and the forces of evil messing with her, seducing her into a trance before putting skeezix in her face and melting her ears to her headphones. Trick or Treat is packed with really great sequences, including the scenes where Eddie stands up to Tim and his lackeys, a moment where Sammy, speaking through Eddie's stereo system, tries to lure Eddie's mom, played by Elaine Joyce, into entering the room, which would not be good for her. Those Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne cameos and all the action packed into the second half. Action that begins with Sammy taking the stage at the high school Halloween dance for a deadly performance of his song, the title track, Trick or Treat. Trick or Treat 1986 is worth watching again and again, especially during the Halloween season, and it deserves to have a lot more horror fans checking it out on an annual basis. Hopefully it'll receive the Blu-ray release it deserves before much longer so it can reach a whole new set of fans, and so the fans it already has can celebrate it to a higher degree than ever before. If you're a fan of 80s horror rock and roll, it's highly recommended that you seek out Trick or Treat as soon as possible. And if you're worried that it plays into the concerns of satanic panicking PMRC parents too much, let Charles Martin Smith assure you when he says, The point we're trying to make in this movie is that rock and roll is not bad, and that although Sammy may have become an insane demented demon back from the dead out to kill people, that doesn't mean Eddie should stop listening to heavy metal. And as Rhett Topham told SammyKerr.com, this movie is not the typical horror flick. So what? It's really ours just for us metalheads. Rock's chosen warriors. And there's no other like it. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support.